Hello cave dwellers and welcome to 2007. Now that doesn't sound very retro, but in the world of tablets and mobile devices, it's practically the Jurassic period. And the Asus R2H is, well, it's a monster to be frank. If Homer Simpson tried to design a tablet like he designed his car, then I really think this would be the result. Powerful like a gorilla, yet soft and yielding like a Nerf ball. And this apparently is how we're going to be using it, by jabbing the top of it blindly with a stylus. I can't wait. Now to be fair to it, it does describe itself as an ultra mobile PC or UMPC, which is a specification created by Microsoft and Intel in 2006 to sit somewhere between tablets and laptops. However, I will call this a tablet today because I think if you showed this to anyone, that's how they would identify it, but it's worth keeping that in mind when assessing it. Let's open the box then and take a look. And inside you'll not only find the tablet, but also an accessory pack, which we'll start with to prepare you for every eventuality. The accessory pack includes a mouse and power cable, pretty standard stuff there. Then we have an Asus branded Windows EasySync cable to ease your migration to the machine, in theory. We've got an antenna, I'll show you why in just a second. Then there's an external LiPo battery pack to extend the battery life to around three and a half hours, which actually is quite impressive for the time. Now tablets are primarily devices to consume entertainment, at least that's what I use mine for. So with that in mind, we've got a TV tuner to go with that antenna, and I can't help but smile at this inclusion. But as if dongles and antennas weren't cramping your style already, you can then plug in this fold out keyboard to take over the entire table at the coffee shop and become an ultra portable road warrior. Throw in a protective sleeve and a remote control, Windows XP tablet edition in case you're still on the fence over whether this is a tablet or not, and a bunch of CDs and DVDs, so it must have a DVD drive somewhere, and you're nearly ready to go. We just need the device itself from box number two. And so I present to you the device that is all things to all people, more thick than slick, and with stickers promising us the power of an Intel Celeron M CPU inside. This is the Asus R2H. Let's take it for a test drive. RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Oh boy, does this thing have a shiny screen. It does make it quite difficult to film and it should have really come with a hood to put over your head and it so you can actually see it. But here we are in Windows XP, which was Microsoft's premier OS for so long, it feels like putting a comfortable slipper back on. It's actually Windows XP Tablet Edition 2005, but it's essentially the same thing with a few extra tablety bells and whistles added on. And like so many Windows PCs of the era, it's stacked full of utilities, antivirus software, and yes, straight up bloatware. Here's a cold boot test for you so you can get an idea of just how long it takes. And I did check that the hard disk's not fragmented and we're running from the main, so it's in performance mode. This is as fast as it gets. That poor spinning 1.8 inch hard disk drive thrashed to within an inch of its life there. And the test was not just to load Windows, but for everything to settle down for all of those extra bits of bloatware that come as factory, because this is a factory standard install, to settle down and for you to actually be able to use the machine. 
You may have noticed that tooltip there popping up to say our display settings are wrong. Ignore that, it's correct, trust me. If we follow that advice, Windows just sets the resolution to a display mode that's too tall for the screen. So you end up scrolling up and down with the mouse like this. And that's a prime example of the kind of thing we don't have to put up with today in a modern tablet. Windows was never really made for this kind of device. And by trying to sledgehammer it into place, these are the kind of problems that come up time and time again. Now we all saw the peripherals in the box, most of which I've plugged in, although it doesn't like our mouse. I've tested that elsewhere and the mouse is actually dead, so we'll have to lose that. But in addition to those bits, we have some fun extra bits built into the device, including a 1.3 megapixel camera for those Skype or MSN messenger calls. Handy, but it's lacking a rear camera, which could be perhaps more useful if you're using this device to try and snap something on site. So here are a few more pictures from around the cave in varying lighting conditions. Without a working mouse, I've resorted to using the mouse joystick here, which is something we also saw on the Toshiba Libretto range recently on the channel. It works well, and it allows you to grip the device while in motion to impress your colleagues or viewers. Are you impressed? I thought you were. Biometrics are the order of the day, with a fingerprint reader here to replace those pesky passwords. And items of note secreted in the edges of the girthy tablet, or gablet as its form factor should now be known, is the Wi-Fi switch, an SD card reader and an AV out port for which I don't have a cable but it looks to be of the composite out variety rather than VGA or DVI. The onboard Wi-Fi is complemented by an Ethernet port right next to an expansion port for an optional docking station here. And the party piece, this is my favourite bit of the whole thing. It's this fold-out GPS antenna. If James Bond could fit this in his backpack, along with a fold-out picnic table for everything to go on, I'm sure he would have. So hopefully now you're starting to get a picture of what this thing's like. It's all very well playing with it down here in the cave, but I think it was better to get out in the real world and give it a test, so that's what I did next. First up, I uninstalled the unnecessary software that we saw, which made it so slow to boot, and I did get the boot down to a more respectable 1 minute and 50 seconds from cold and about 25 seconds from standby, so that's a little bit better, but it's still not that instant-on experience that we expect from modern-day tablets. And then I went out for a drive to test that fun GPS, which is hidden away on the back of the device there. And this actually worked really well, as you'll see here in auto route. I wasn't using this as a route planner, just tracking my progress, and that's just as well, because the screen is so reflective, it would make for a terrible sat nav. But it's a useful feature, and it did track my progress well. And the window screensaver also kicked in as I approached a roundabout. So again, if I was using this as a route planner, I'd need to make a few tweaks to make sure that doesn't happen. In the US, you'd have had streets and trips bundled instead of auto route, Papa Go in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore, Ling Tu in China, and Goldfinger if you were in Australia. Now, the next test I wanted to do was to just watch some TV, watch some TV on the go. What could be better than that? And I did that using the bundle to digital TV USB dongle here. Now, it came with its own little portable aerial, and I had no success whatsoever with that. When tuning, it found absolutely no channels. So um, I resorted to plugging it into the aerial on the top of my house, which kind of kills the portability factor of it, but I just wanted to see it working, so that's what I did. And yes, that unsurprisingly then found plenty of TV stations. But despite my best efforts, I was forever trapped on Channel 5 and a show about debt collectors. Whenever I tried to change the channel, the software just crashed. I'm sure alternative software can be found, but this is what came in the box, so this is what I may well have experienced if I'd bought this back in the day. And then I went for a walk into a field. See, I told you I'd field test it, and that's exactly what I'm doing here, going to see my goatee friends who were less than impressed with the device. I did try and film them. I know this camera isn't really made for outdoor filming, it's really for video conferencing indoors and that kind of thing. But here's a, a shot of me trying to film the goats and you can see the automatic gamma settings just went absolutely crazy. I could probably fix this, but the screen was so reflective I couldn't really see what I was filming. So it wasn't until I got back that I saw the quality of the image. So um, 
unsuccessful there, but then the goat did burp at the tablet and try to eat it. <laughs> so that's a pretty conclusive review by the goats, I think. Dan, who donated this, says that there was a DVD drive with it, which is now missing, and that's unsurprising because a USB DVD drive would have been quite a useful thing to have to use on your other machines, so I'm not surprised that that's disappeared. Now, performance-wise, remember it had the Celeron M sticker down there. It's running at around 900 megahertz, and it's pretty poor, to be honest. It's power-hungry, it's underwhelming compared to the ARM-based alternatives which dominate the mobile market today, and the constant whirring of the fan to keep it all cool on the top here is a reminder of that. And there's also the design for Windows XP, but Windows Vista capable sticker down here. That's a sticker that we saw on machines that were being launched just before Vista came out. So it was to try and reassure consumers that they could upgrade it. The base spec of this machine actually doesn't meet the minimum spec of Vista when it came out. Uh, this one has been upgraded to have a lot more RAM, so it does just scrape in there. But if you try to run Vista on this, particularly when it first came out and before a few service packs ironed out the creases, it would have been a torrid time. I wouldn't have recommended that to anyone. It would have just been even slower and even more painful than it already is with Windows XP. What this represents then is a period in computer history when Windows and Intel went unopposed for far too long, in my opinion, in the mainstream. A lack of innovation collided with consumer demand for portability, and this kind of thing was the result. It wasn't the only example. Samsung released the Q1 a year before, and it's of a similar form factor and suffers similar shortcomings. But Samsung would learn their lesson a couple of years later in 2010 and come up with the Samsung Galaxy tablet and uh, charge onwards with the form factor that we now know. It's a painful reminder of a time when Microsoft thought that a desktop OS could be crowbarred into any form factor that they liked and of single core CPUs struggling to give us a responsive experience and of solid state disks being out of reach for cheap mainstream devices. It's a fudge. And for many of us, we've been conditioned over the years to put up with this kind of rubbish. But by 2007, I think a lot of us were really starting to think there has to be something better around the corner. The R2H is basically a laptop without the hinge. It has devices bolted on like the GPS, which could easily be picked up from makers like Garmin and plugged into your laptop if needed. Or in the case of the TV tuner, it's just a regular USB TV tuner. You could have picked that up from anywhere and you could have just as easily plugged that into your desktop and used it if you needed to. There is nothing special or portable about that. It's just a bit crap. The R2H then scores two fuses and a tape dispenser for its review score, and it's not something I recommend you add to your collection. But like all things donated to the cave, it's very much appreciated and will be looked after as an example of the lessons we had to learn along the way to tablet enlightenment. As always, thank you for taking the time to watch. Take care and see you soon. If you enjoy my content and would like to support The Cave while receiving a completely ad-free experience and access to releases one week before they go public, then visit patreon.com forward slash retromancave and join the official cave dwellers. Thank you for your support.